Well, come on, let's give Jesus one more hand clap in the house. Come on, can we really give him one more hand clap in the house today? Anybody glad to be at church? Come on, I'm glad. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor, tell them this, say you're lucky you got to sit by me today. And welcome all of our campuses watching online. Y'all give them a big hand clap, big welcome from Owensboro. What's up, Amarillo, Dumas, Henderson? We love you. Believe something good's going to happen to you today. Tell you, I was so excited to get to church today. I found myself doing 70 and a 45, and uh, somebody pulled me over for that just to tell me it was the Lord's Day. And and uh, God has grace on sinners and speeders. Can I get an amen out there? So uh, they, they wrote it to me for just five miles over, so we give God a hand clap for that. I got away with a little something today. And I'm reminding to, I'll be reminded to slow down. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm pumped to see you. I really feel uh, like today's a special day. And today is a day where, where we do our His Honor offering. Every year, once a year, we do an over and above giving where we enter into what we call radical generosity and we come and we honor God with a sacrificial financial gift. And we're going to do that here in a minute. We did it in the first service. I'll tell you, it was, it was over the top. And just so some of you know kind of what's happened through these His Honor offerings throughout the years, the building you're sitting in, the way we got the down money to be able to buy this building came from the generosity in His Honor. Uh, kids Renovation came from the His Honor. Uh, the screens, the sound, all that stuff came from His Honor. The, the normal tithe takes care of the house and pays the bills and pays the staff, but with His Honor this last year, we were able to get our church going in Henderson, Kentucky. Come on, on Easter, Henderson had 380 people in attendance, 380 people, because somebody gave. This last year, His Honor... Um, we were able to help. How many of y'all heard Pastor Shane Warren preach here just a few weeks ago? We were able to give him the seed, uh, that church, the seed money to get that church started. Come on, they have, they've just renovated a new building. 300 people in the house on Easter. You ought to give God a bigger hand clap than that. All that came because somebody cared. Got a renovated kids area, roofs on buildings, Dumas, Texas, campus renovated. All of that's because somebody gave something to create a space for those who are yet to come. You know, I walked into a church in 1998 and I wasn't, I wasn't saved. As a matter of fact, I was all messed up. I was a meth amp freak and uh, uh, didn't know where I was going or what I was doing. But somebody prayed and somebody paid and somebody had a seat ready for me there. And I came in and I set myself down in that seat and I heard the gospel. And I'll tell you, today we're going to give and we're going to create a seat and a space for somebody else. They're going to come, they're going to hear the gospel, and we're going to get to be a part of it. And it's going to be a blessing. Can I get an amen? You know, I love uh, a joke. Some of you probably heard me tell it before, but I'm going to tell it again because I think it's funny. But... There were a couple of guys, and they were, they were out on a boat. They were doing their thing and uh, had a boat crash. You know, they wrecked the boat. They found themselves stranded on this deserted island. And one of the guys was just freaking out. He's out there. He's losing his mind. He's like, my God, we're on this deserted island. We have no money. We have no resources. We don't even have a blade between the two of us. We're going to die. And the other guy is as cool as a cucumber. He said, don't worry about it. We're going to be all right, man. He said, what do you mean we're going to be all right? We're, we're, on a, we're on a stranded out. Don't worry about it. We're going to be all right, man. What, are, are you kidding me? Are you delusional? Did you get hit? No, no, no. Listen, we're going to be fine. My pastor will find me. He says, what do you mean your pastor will find you? Your pastor has no search and rescue skills. He's a, he's a preacher. No, listen, my pastor will find me. Calm down. What are, you, what are you talking about your pastor's going to find, find me? He said, listen, I'm a multimillionaire. I give 40000 a week to my church. My pastor will find me. I, I promise you he will find me. Come on. <laughs> How many know I might not be able to find you, but the Spirit of God can find you wherever you are in the earth? How many of y'all believe that? Believe he can find us, help us, and lift us. We're going to honor him, and he's going to honor us. Let's pray and thank him, thank him for being here. Father, we thank you for being here right now. I pray you, I pray you would activate supernatural faith in the house. You said when the Son of Man returns to the earth, will he find faith? I declare you'll find faith in us. As we say we walk by faith and not by sight. And so right now I release a spirit of faith into every campus supernaturally. Rise up, take your place, shake off fear, stand on the scripture, 
Don't back down in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. I want to entitle this message today, The Honor of David. The Honor of David. Now I want us to take a look at the life of King David. Now, King David is my favorite person in scripture. Obviously, Jesus is my Messiah. I love Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. He is the rabbi. But the person that I look at and I can see, how many of y'all can see some of your own shortcomings in the life of David and learn lessons there? So I think David is, is a place we find so many lessons. And David missed it in places, but David knocked it out of the park in places. And the place that David really knocked it out of the park in was being a man of honor. David's this kid. He's the youngest of his household. The prophet is told by God that his father, his name was Jesse, that, that Jesse had a son at his farm that would be the next king of Israel. And so they throw a big feast. The, the prophet's coming, man. Everybody straighten up. It's time to get your beard trimmed. It's time to, you know, iron your shirt. It's time to clean your room up. Prophet's coming to town. And the prophet gets there, and uh, he starts looking at all the boys. And he goes to the tallest boy first, and he says, that's not him, the oldest. Next one, that's not him. Next one, that's not him. All of them look like they should have been king. And then the prophet goes to the youngest boy the one that wasn't even there. They had to go get him out in the fields. He was forgotten. They didn't even care enough about David at the time to bring him up there. They say, do you have another son, the prophet says. And so they go out into the wilderness where David was tending his father's flock. They bring him before the prophet. The prophet says, thus saith the Lord, you will be the next king of Israel. And he broke open a flask of oil and he poured the oil of a king on the head of David. So listen, God doesn't look on the outward appearance, right? God's not looking at your pedigree. God's not looking at your stature. God's not looking at your zip code. God's not looking at your bank account. God's not looking at any of that. Man looks on all that outward stuff, but God looks on the heart. God found a heart in David that was a heart of honor. He chose him to be the next king. Now, scholars say this happened when David was 10 to 13 years of age, and you know, you would think the next day he'd be the king of Israel, but he wasn't. As a matter of fact, 2 Samuel 5, verses 4 and 5 says it took this long. It's prophesied to 10 to 13 years of age. But it says this, it says, David was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. It took somewhere from 17 to 20 years for that word to come to pass. And then when he was 30 years old, he just got part of the word. He became the king over Judah. And another seven years later, he becomes the king over all of Israel. What's the lesson to learn here? No matter what the word of the Lord is all over your life, if you don't see the fulfillment of it all, you ought to praise him in the partial on the way to the fulfillment of the word. Right? You ought to praise him before you ever get there. Don't get bitter. Don't get messed up. Just praise him because you're halfway there. How many are thankful that you're halfway better than you were five years ago? Come on, somebody. Might not be all together, but we're better. Can I get an amen out there? How many of you think for your spouse is somewhat better than they were a few years ago? I get an amen. Don't say it too loud. You'll get in trouble out there. I know you're thankful right over here, but I'm just, I'm just saying. So it's, it's, it's the way it is. Praise him in the partial. And David goes all the way to becoming the king of Israel. Shepherd boy, think about it. He's one of the most known men in Jewish history. They're still digging up little bits of rock and little insignias that have King David's inscription on it from 3,000 years ago. He lived 1,000 years B.C. It's when he was on the earth. And David's still being talked about. How does a man get that kind of honor? Well, that man learned to honor God. The only way you become that kind of person of honor is you become a person that honors God. Here's the rule. If you're taking notes, you ought to write this down and Put it in your heart. Teach it to your children. If you will sow honor in life, you will reap favor. If I sow honor, I reap favor. Come on, let's say it at every campus. If I sow honor, I reap favor. Let's say it again. If I sow honor, I reap favor. 
The first person that taught David honor, and this was a person that wasn't even perfect, was his father, Jesse. Now, Jesse forgot about David whenever the prophet came to town, but Jesse showed David some principles. There was a time when the kingdom of Israel was fighting with the Philistines. It was the day that Goliath was showing up on the battlefield. Goliath's coming down, he's cussing everybody out. He's making fun of all the, all the guys from Israel, calling them out on the carpet. Nobody will take him up on it because he's a great big guy. You know, he's like nine feet tall or something. And they're looking at him and they're like, we don't have a chance. And so what Jesse does is Jesse sends supplies down to the captain of the army of Israel. He sends a gift. He sends uh, really a gift of honor. You know, whenever the Bible talks about honoring God, almost always talks about giving something to God. To honor is to give. To honor is to serve. To honor is to sow. You honor the Lord with your worship. The Bible says you honor the Lord with your first fruits. It's impossible to honor God without giving something to God. And so what Jesse does is Jesse says, David, I want you to take all this cheese. I want you to take these raisins. I want you to take this bread. He loaded up a, a cart with wine. He says, I want you to take all these gifts, take them down to the boys that are on the front lines that are fighting against the Philistines. How many of y'all believe we ought to honor our men and women of service that keep our country safe and all, all the people, you know, the, the thin blue line? Come on. How many of y'all think we ought to honor all them? Can I get an amen out there? I'm thankful for them. David's dad knew this, and he sent a gift. Now, I'll tell you, whatsoever a man sows, he's going to reap in life. If you sow friendship, you'll reap friendship. Can I get an amen? If you sow help, you'll reap help. Can I get an amen? If you sow being a jerk face, you'll receive getting a jerk face action back. Can I get an amen out there? Whether it's positive or negative, you reap what you sow. It's an eternal principle. And so what David did by command of his father, he learned this here. So he goes down and he honors the captain of Israel. And that honor opens up a doorway of opportunity for David. What was the doorway of opportunity for David? It was that there was a Goliath calling for a man to fight with on the field. For most people, it looked like a problem. But to young David, anointed and called by God, it looked like an opportunity. Come on, if you'll be the kind of person that looks at what the world calls a problem and sees it as an opportunity, you can move heaven and earth for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He looks and he sees the opportunity. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should stand and defy the army of the living God? David, a boy, says, I'll go out and I'll battle with him because my God is stronger than his God. I've got news for you, his church. Your God is stronger than the God of this world. Your God is stronger than the Marxist agenda. Your God is stronger than a demon-possessed government. Your God is stronger. Can I get an amen? Doesn't matter what they say. It matters what he says. David knew what he'd said. He knew that, he knew that guy couldn't beat him. And he goes out, and that opportunity comes. They sowed favor, honor, excuse me, and he reaps favor. You know the rest of the story. David goes out in the battlefield, and God anoints that sling, and he throws that stone, and it sinks deep in that giant's head. The giant goes down, and the best part of the story is David took his sword off that giant, cut off his head with his own sword, and took that head as a trophy. Come on, I declare in 2021, we're going to take the head of our giant in Jesus' mighty, mighty name by sowing honor to the Most High God. David learns to sow honor. One of the second ways David had learned to sow honor is David was a man of worship. Oh, oh, that I would become more of a man of worship every year in my life. When I first came into the church, I didn't understand worship or praise at all. As a matter of fact, I was extremely uncomfortable. I preferred to wait till all the hands in the air like you just don't care was over and I'd come in and listen to the preaching, right? I, I just, I, I didn't identify. David learned very young to be a man of worship. As a matter of fact, he's tending his father's sheep. He's on the backside of the desert. He has a harp, and he's writing songs to God. If you open up the Psalms and you read them, you'll read many of the Psalms or the songs of David. They're prophetic songs that came to David when he's crying out, open his heart, playing his harp to God. 
He wrote things like the greatest song that has ever been written, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your staff and your rod, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will, I said, I will, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How does David get that? He gets that by being a man of worship. You'd be surprised when you honor God with your worship, with your praise. The ideas that come into your heart, into your mind. Prophetic things release you. I'm telling you, you become a person of worship. God's one little whisper in your worship service can change your life for the next 10 years. Can I get an amen? How many of y'all have had God talk to you in those moments? Like any other time, he's speaking. Listen, David becomes this man of worship. Was such a man of worship, he becomes king of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant, which is a symbol of the presence of God, it was off in a foreign place. First order of business for David is we're bringing the Ark back. And he goes and he gets it. He brings it back. Sets up a place called the Tabernacle of David up on the Temple Mount. The ark is sitting there. There's no curtains around it. People are falling down and singing and worshiping God around the ark 24 hours a day, seven days a week. David paid for that to happen because he knew worship was so powerful. Come on, at every campus right now, you ought to clap your hands to God. We ought to worship God like David worshiped God. Come on, somebody ought to shout to the heavens. I'm telling you, our God is worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Honor him. And he'll favor you. David becomes this man. He understands. If he sows honor, he'll reap favor. Now David was not a perfect man. David made some big hiccups. I've stood uh, many times now at the place where they say David was looking down at Bathsheba while she bathed. David had a thing for women. He loved women, and what's not to like about women? But you have to learn to love one man, not women. Can I get an amen out there, man? I'll keep you out of trouble. He loved them all. And uh, David's up in this high place. Whenever you, whenever you grow in Israel back then, you would live higher on the hill, right? Uh, lower, lower socioeconomic, low on the hill, higher up, moving on up. It's where the whole idea comes from. And so David's king now. He's up on top of the hill. And he's supposed to be at war at this point in his life with his men. He stays home. He's hanging out. He's in his robe. He's watching like YouTube or something, watching Narcos for the seventh time, wasting time. And he walks out on the corner of the hill, and he looks down, and he sees Bathsheba, and she's naked. And I always say this to young men. If you look down and you see a naked woman, the first time you've been blessed, that's funny. <laughs> but if you see her the second time, you can't control what you see the first time. Can I get an amen out there? But if you see her the second time, you've been cursed. You got to learn to control your soul. Can I get an amen? Look the other way. Turn your head. Come on, look down. I got to look somewhere else. Oh, I'm preaching better than you're amening right now. Are you nervous out there? This is America. I know what you watch at night. You're not so holy. Come on. Right? Second time will get you in trouble. David kept watching. Whatever you watch long enough, you go after. It's the, way, it's the way humanity is wired. Goes after Bathsheba, takes her into his house, gets her pregnant, and then has her husband assassinated so that he can have her. One of the biggest blunders of David's life. David repents later on. There'll be prophetic judgment against his life and house because of it. But God, being the God of all grace, restored David even after such a heinous crime. How many of are thankful that our God is a forgiving, loving, kind, and generous God? Come on, if you've been forgiven much, you ought to give him praise much right now. I'm thankful that he's a generous, forgiving God. Now, there's another time David flubs big time. It's a time that he decides he's going to count and do a census of the people of Israel. And the kings of Israel were told that you're not to count your military. You're not to take the number of your horses and all your implements of war. 
wasn't because you shouldn't do inventory of it. It was for a different reason. It was so you wouldn't begin to trust in your army instead of trusting in the God of the army. See, in America, we started to trust in our, our, our power, the power of our dollar, the power of our military, the power of who we've, who we've, who we've been. But now, you know, all that can be going very quickly. We better remember the God that put America on the map in the first place. And if we'll trust in that God that we covenanted with and we built the Constitution around his principles, then we'll have something. It's not the power of the army. It's the God of the army. David, David, in his pride, did a census of Israel. And because of that, a judgment came upon the land. The Bible says a plague came upon the land. And not a plague with a 99.8% recovery rate. I'm talking about bodies piling up in the streets. I'm talking black plague kind of stuff. Bubonic plague level. Next level death. David realizes he's done something he needs to repent. What's he going to do when he repents? He's going to bring God an offering. He's going to honor the Lord. And he goes out to a place where they would burn an offering. There was a threshing floor there. There was another king that this threshing floor bordered his property by the name of Arunah. And he goes to Arunah and he says, I want to burn an offering here to the, to the Lord so that this plague might be stopped. And Arunah says, hey, what's this place between me and you? I'll give you the the place to burn the offering. I'll give you the, the animals to slaughter. I'll give you the wood. Arunah's loaded. He doesn't care. David turns around and says, no, I'll pay you for every bit of it because I will not give to God an offering that costs me nothing. David knew for it to be honor and for it to be a real offering that it must be sacrificial. Come on. There's a time, church, that your giving must become sacrificial. There's a time, church, your prayer must become sacrificial. There's a time, church, your fasting must become sacrificial because if not, you've given God an offering that costs you nothing. How many know it's easy to give away somebody else's stuff? It's harder to give away your own stuff. Why? Because you paid the price. How many know when I was a kid, I remember my parents giving me some stuff I didn't take care of the way I should have. Why? Because I didn't pay for it. But when you grow up and you start paying for it, how many know you begin to know the value of it? Come on, come on, let's give our parents a hand clap for not killing us when they should have, amen? Let's give them a hand clap for, for, for doing that, the good ones. Listen, David says, I won't give an offering that didn't cost me anything. Man, the, the crown achievement, I think, of David's life is David had it in his heart to build God a house. At this point, the Ark of the Covenant, it's intense. It's up on the Temple Mount, God said he loved that place, but David starts looking around and he says, man, I live in a paneled house. I live in, I live in king's garments. I live pretty high on the hog. And he says, and the house of God, God dwells in a tent up on the hill. And he goes to the prophet and he says to the prophet, prophet, I've got it in my heart to build God a house. I think it's a great thing to have it in your heart. I pray that every person at his church would have it in their heart to build God's house, to build God's kingdom. Come on, to, to build the church. And I'm not just talking about buildings. we got to have buildings, but come on, to be a part of gospel people and multiplication. I have it in my heart to build God a house. It's what motivates me, drives me. It's what I've lived my adult life doing. There's nothing else on the earth like the church. I'm telling you, the Lions Club isn't like the church. The, the, the Country Club isn't like the church. No social program is like the church. The Salvation Army is not like the church. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, most important thing in the world. There's nothing else like it. It's the only thing God's building. David has a little bit of that in his heart. In an Old Testament sense, says, I have it in my heart to build, build God a house. And he tells the prophet, prophet, I'm going to build God's a God a house. And the prophet says, that's great, David. You, you should build God a house. And the prophet misses it the first time. Sees a man just like you or me, but one with a gift. Misses it. He goes home and he goes to bed that night. God speaks to him in his sleep and says, tell David he can't build my house. So there's blood on his hands. Now, some have said there was blood on David's hands because he was such a man of war. I do not believe that's the blood that was on David's hands that made it where he could not build the house of God. 
Every person that served in the armed forces, if you had to spill blood for the protection of your country, Romans chapter 13 says that you are an instrument of peace in the earth, that you had the sword for a reason. Come on, let's give them one more hand clap. Don't feel guilty. You did what you had to do for the protection of our nation. Amen? The blood that the prophet is talking about to David is the blood of Uriah, who he stole his wife and unjustly killed the man for his possession. And he says, you can't build me a house. So God told David, no. How many of y'all hate hearing the word no? Come on. You can't tell us no, we're Americans, baby, right? Tell me no, I do what I want, amen? Sometimes I feel that way. People tell me no, I'm like, you can't tell me no. Why not? Because I'm Brian, you can't tell me no, right? It's the way we all feel. A lot of times you tell people no, they get offended. I found in churches they'll leave and become Methodists if you tell them no or Baptist or, or something else, right? They're like leaving the charismatic. If we're leaving your church. You said no. You know, sometimes God says no. And it's the, one of the biggest tests of our maturity. Because no stinks. Can I get an Amen. But how many of y'all believe he knows better than we do and his plan is perfect? And even in his no, there's a better yes. Even in his no, there's a better yes somewhere around the corner. I mean, there's been times I thought, I just couldn't figure out why it hadn't happened yet. Well, there was a better yes around the corner. God told David no, and most people would have went home or they would have said, well, we're done with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're going we're to bring back Molech and the Asherahs and Baals and we're going to worship false gods. But David didn't do that. David went to work putting together the largest offering that had ever been given in the history of Israel. He said, if I can't build the house, then my son will build the house and I'll make sure every penny is there when it's time for the first stone to be laid. I want to take you now I'll close with this text, and we're going to bring an offering ourselves, like David, in just one moment. First Chronicles chapter 29. Let me show you the offering that David put together for the building of the house of God. Even after God told him he couldn't build it himself, David puts together an offering for a temple he doesn't know if he'll ever get to see or not, the completion. But he does it anyway because he loves God and he wants to build his kingdom. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1 says this. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, who alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great because the temple is not for man but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God I prepare with all my might gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, Iron for things of iron, wood for things for, of wood, onyx, stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, because I've set my affection on the house of my God, I've given to the house of my God up over and above all that I prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold, the gold of Ophir, 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses, gold for things of gold and silver for things of silver, and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. Then he asked this question. He's gathered together the people of God, and he's got the heads of the choice families of Israel. He says, I brought my offering for the house of God. Here it is. You're looking at it. Gold and silver and stones and iron and, man, more stuff than you could shake a stick at. I mean, he brought the goods. And he shows them. He leads by saying, here's what I'll do. I'll give. Then he asks them this question. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day with me to the Lord? He says, I brought mine. Now, who's going to give with me? David calls him on the carpet. You know, David brought a gift. Think about this. David favored God as a young shepherd boy, honored God. And because David honored God, God so favored David that he lifted him up out of obscurity and took him being a poor, uh, passed over shepherd boy to being David the great, the king of Israel that we're still talking about to this day. 
David was so financially blessed in that one offering. Here's what he gave. He gave $1.3 billion in modern day wealth to the building of the house of God. Would anybody out there like to be able to give $1.3 billion to the work of the gospel? What could we do with $1.3 billion? Can I get an amen? Mark Zuckerberg, instead of canceling me on Facebook, you ought to join this church and give an offering. Amen. $1.3 billion. Then he speaks up and he says this. He goes past it. He asks them if they're going to give and, and they bring another $1.8 billion together of people he challenges. And that temple was paid for before they ever started. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap. A paid for church project before you ever begin. It's amazing. They build a temple for people to enjoy for generations. That's what it's about. When we give, it's not just for us. We're giving for those who are yet to come. David was giving for the next generation. How many of y'all want your kids and your grandkids to have the same kind of spirit-filled churches in America in 20 or 30 years that you were grow, you were raised with and you have today? It's only going to happen if somebody gives. Do you know that? It's only going to happen if somebody serves. Only going to happen if somebody fasts. Only going to happen if somebody prays. Only going to happen if somebody contends. If you won't contend, you won't see it. That's why you have to contend for the faith. So I'm here to challenge you this morning. And I'm not just challenging you. I challenge myself. I brought my gift in the first, first service with the first service people. It's time for us to give together. This is the one time a year we do it sacrificially. Ushers, I want you to begin to bring out the His Honor offering envelopes. We're going to prepare a gift. We're not going to give something to God that doesn't cost us anything. We're going to give sacrificially. We do this once a year. It's the one big one a year. And here's what we say. Um, we give some kind of gift today, but you got eight weeks to give it. We do an eight-week deal where you, you, you have a goal, a faith goal, and then over the next eight weeks, you bring that gift to the house of God. And, you know, there's different, there's different places in life for everybody. It's not, it's not the amount of money you give. It's the amount of sacrifice. So here's what I always say. Like, you've got the story of the widow's might, right? The story of the widow's might. She's given an offering. Jesus is taking the offering. Jesus is looking in the bucket at what people give. It's a little uncomfortable, isn't it, right? He's just looking in the bucket, and he's, he's seeing what everybody gave. And he sees this widow. She gives this coin. And he pulls it out, and he says, holy moly. He says, this is the largest offering that was given today. It's like a penny. Why was it so large? She had nothing. Right? The single mom that gives 50 bucks has done something amazing. College kid doesn't have a job. I saw them giving money for a service. That, that's amazing. Come on, our young people. How many of y'all want to see our young people trained to take care of the things of God? If they can learn it at that age, they'll grow into something supernatural. So there's the widow's might. We talk about that. Then, then we talk about big offerings. You'll hear preachers talk about miracle offerings that paid for stuff. And some, somebody that's really been blessed gave like a million dollars to this project or a quarter million over here or something like that. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not the widow's mite. And I'll, I'll, I'll never, I'll never, I mean, I, I don't have a million dollars to give. So they kind of feel like they're off the hook. I'm like David. I'm not going to let you off the hook. Who then will sanctify themselves with me today? Who then will consecrate? It's not, it's about right where you are doing what you should do. Can I get an amen? Not what somebody else should do. Who then will consecrate themselves with me today? And give. Take care of the house of God. What do we do with it? We renovate buildings. We build new churches. We start new campuses. This year, y'all know Lana Vasquez and Life Impact International. How many of y'all love Lana? Been fighting the sex slave trade for 20 years on the Thai Burma border. One of the largest um, human rights violations on the earth is happening right now in Burma. She's involved right there. We're going to cut off a piece of this offering and we're going to send a, we're going to send a blessing to that ministry. We're going to do that. We're going to, plant, we're going to plant more campuses. We're at four right now. Plant another church. Come on. We're going to plant 100 campuses to the glory of God. 
I want you to get prepared. Ask God. I'm going to turn the other campuses over to the campus pastors. Pastor John, uh, Pastor Frank, you guys take over right there right now. Begin to lead your congregation. Come on, y'all give them a hand clap as they, as they go. And they, We love you. Come on, I say revival's coming to Henderson. Revival's coming to Dumas, Texas in Jesus' name. So now let, let's think about what we're going to do. You could take that envelope, give you some time to prepare it. You look at the top right corner, it's got today's gift, what you're going to give today, your total eight-week giving future pledge. So what we call it, our total eight-week giving, and then our total. And if you put your name and stuff on there where we can know it's a, a real pledge. So I've, I've seen some, you know, $2 million pledges from Batman before, which I... It was hard to report that to the accounting team, right? I don't know if they believed it. So uh, we want to make sure it is a real human and not one of our teenagers having a big time, right? Um, uh, either one of those things could happen. So fill that out now, and let's bring it in faith. We're going to honor God today. God's going to, God's going to honor us. Uh, a couple of things that happened here while you're getting ready. This last year, renovated the kids' ministry got renovated. I think it was this year. COVID made everything run together in our mind. Uh, the youth center, uh, touch up. I know we've got, had roofing projects around America. Man, Henderson campus rocking. By the way, uh, they're outgrowing their building right now. Isn't that cool that we planned a church right now? It's, it's, it's outgrowing its building right now. Do something over there. Um, we're going to keep going because God needs a voice, a prophetic voice in America. God needs the voice of his church in America. God needs a place that's not ashamed of the Holy Spirit in America. God needs a, a church that will stand up for the values of the word of God in America. How many know too many people played ball the other way and we, we've damaged our nation? It's dark. But I believe we're, we're in an hour that God can use us for revival. Can I get an amen out there? Once you get this ready, here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring this and we're going to lay it right here on the altar today. I want you to bring it whenever you're ready. Bring it and lay it right here on the altar. We're going to count it in a moment. You can, you can bring it to the altar whenever you're ready. I'm telling you God's going to bless us abundantly. Not because uh, we give just to get. We give because we love God. And then God always blesses you back because you cannot outgive God. Can I get an amen? All right. In the first service, there was uh, 82,000 given in the first service this morning. I know there was another 35,000 given over in uh, Henderson this morning. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap for that. Uh, there's a $40 gift given. There's one without anything on it. There's a $100 gift. There's a $1,000 gift. There's a, a $500 gift given right there. Let's see what we've done together. There's one without anything on it. Some of these have. Uh, there's another $100 gift. It's one without the number on the outside. It's got something inside. But let's see what we've done. There's a $200 gift. There's a $100 gift. There's a $1,500 gift. There's a, a $10 gift, thank God. There's a, a $1,000 gift. There is a, that didn't have a total on it. There's a $1,000 gift. There's a $2,000 gift. There is a um, $200 gift, $500 gift, $1,000 gift, $500 gift. There's, there's $11. There's a $1,500 gift. There's a $4,000 gift. There's a $700 gift. There's a $8,000 gift. There's a $100 gift. 
You moan a lot when you get down there, Bill. What's up with that? There's a there's a fifteen hundred dollar gift. There's a eight hundred dollar gift. Praise the Lord. What's that put us at today, Heather? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, the church gave a hundred and three thousand this morning as an over and above gift. Come on, let's give God a hand clap. That's what we did together. Come on, somebody ought to stand up on their feet. Give God a hand clap today. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for what you're going to do with it. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to pray over every person that's giving. More will come in next week. It always happens a couple weeks in a row. People come to give. But I want to pray a blessing. I want to pray that we, we've, we've sown honor and we will indeed reap favor. How many of y'all want to reap some favor in 2021, 2022? Come on, lift a hand to heaven if you're comfortable with it. Father, I thank you that we've sown honor. Supernaturally, we've sown honor. Now, I declare indeed that we reap favor. I speak favor over the people under the sound of my voice. I say favor in their physical bodies. Favor in their spiritual life. Favor in this church, Father. I I pray that we would prosper, succeed, and achieve. I pray that our children would do better than we've ever done. That we would go upward and onward. Father, give us ideas. Let us hear your voice. Keep us from the evil one. Put your hand upon our children. I say our kids have the right friends and they're far from the wrong ones. Put them in the right schools. Put them in the right jobs. I release supernatural favor to the people of his church in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. And the church said, amen, 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 amen.